Welcome to our community forum. I'm Tim Madigan from the Department of Philosophy and I'll be your host. Dr. Ronald R. Sundstrom is a professor of philosophy at the University of San Francisco and a member of its African American Studies program. His research focuses on the philosophy of race and the related areas of racism, xenophobia, and mixed race identity, political philosophy and urban philosophy, and the political philosophy of Frederick Douglass. He published several essays and two books in these areas, including the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on Douglass, the book The Browning of America and the Evasion of Social Justice, came out in 2008, and Just Shelter, Integration, Gentrification, and Race and Reconstruction, which is published by Oxford University Press and will be coming out later this year. I'll be back with Professor Sundstrom in a moment. Please stay with us. Well, Professor Sundstrom, welcome to St. John Fisher University. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Madigan. And we could be Ron and Tim, but I okay, will okay. start officially. Okay. Right. But you gave a tremendous talk yesterday as part of our annual UNESCO World Philosophy Day conference on Frederick Douglass. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just saying you know, what the talk was about. The talk was called The Dread of Tyrants, um, Frederick Douglass on the freedom to uh, speak, listen and learn. And in it, I traced out Douglass's long history of defending those rights as central to his project of emancipation and, and abolition, and uh, his basic uh, view of what it is to be a person, what in philosophy we call a, a philosophical anthropology or uh, the philosophy of the human person. And I wanted to show how that was relevant to his historical uh, legacy. Um, and then um, not only sh showing, trying to demonstrate why and how this was important from him, stretching from the beginning of his career through his own personal autobiography, but also um, how it, uh, what, it what, its, what its meaning was for him. It's not, right, this, this, this vision of freedom um, can be thought of in very different ways, um, very autonomous, very personal very, uh, you, you know, um, do as I please vision of freedom, mm -hmm. right? On uh, disconnected from one's, one's, uh, one's self, one's society, and just pure personal expression, or a vision of freedom that's grounded in purpose. And so my argument was that uh, Douglas's vision of freedom is grounded in purpose, and, and, and not just, of course, the purpose of emancipation and abolition, but a deep moral purpose that drove his activist work for emancipation. That was a big part of it. Another aspect of the talk um, and my research is um, on his vision of deliberation, his vision of moral suasion, and why for him that was a necessary project for building the American Republic, um, and one that uh, he felt it was important to keep on going with. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Sometimes people turn to Douglas and see many different things in him, including, for example, which I think is an error, right? See him as someone who uh, takes, does not take race very seriously. He took it very seriously. His vision is different than perhaps our vision today um, for good reasons or for bad reasons. Uh, he was very much open to a world that he saw as deeply integrated, yeah. uh, right? Um, which some people welcome and some people don't. And then um, he also had this vision of the world that was involved in deliberation and nation building. And that's what I tried to emphasize yesterday. In um, those on the far left or the far right, you see Douglas' as an excuse to ignore, to ignore uh, the difficulties of our world from the far right or from the far left. You think that Douglas is an icon of a kind of burn it all down radicalism. That's not the case with his own legacy. Douglas is Douglas's legacy is a legacy of the common good and a freedom for purpose. Well, we talked about the fact that there's Douglas's legacy in the sense that our airport sure. is named for him. Yes. We have a bridge yes. named for him, many uh, streets and right. uh, statues and yeah. what have you. But I think 
you were stressing that the real legacy of Douglas are his words. Yes. And to what extent do they still resonate in the present day? Yes. Yeah, those words are not just words, of course. They were speeches. Mm -hmm. They were, uh, they were uh, newspaper articles and editorials, many of which he penned here in Rochester, yeah. right? Um, and uh, as part of his project, of his own personal newspaper that he uh, that drove his ideas, the North Star, famous uh, a famous periodical in the United States. Unfortunately, we do not have enough copies of the, those original those original papers. And then um, his work that proved ultimately successful, helping to advocate the United States to end slavery and to fight for emancipation. And then after slavery, to work for uh, women's rights, the women's right to vote, universal suffrage, as we say, right, for everybody, no matter what class, no matter what race, no matter what gender or sex. Um, and then um, his fight for his fight and allyship with peoples across the world in their attempt to throw down monarchism, yeah. right, as we know from his, his experience in, in, in Ireland and his drawing common cause with the Irish people um, and their Republican urges, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, right, his work for the U.S. government um, as an envoy to special minister to, to Haiti, right, he was a guy who was very much involved in the freedom struggle of many peoples, right, with a long and storied history. Want someone who believed in a in a diverse, multicultural, pluralistic uh, America, right? That he called a composite nation. We use phrases like multiculturalism or pluralism. It's a his, his is a very, if you will, odd word, composite. Like we're talking about some kind of physical material, yeah. like composite, like composite clay or composite dirt or composite rock. But his was the idea that we're all these separate little bits. We put us all together um, to form a whole. Right, and you get this from a really important essay of his that ha pops up towards the end of his life called the, um, Our Composite Nationality. Yeah, what, do you know when he wrote that? I believe it is, um, I believe that that date is around 1860. Okay. Is that when we get that piece, right? He's certainly commenting on um, and taking part in the debate about um, immigration to the United States. He witnessed, of course, and fought back against the anti-black racism of his time, but he's also seeing parallels with the attitudes of America, of Americans at the time, to the Irish immigrants, to Italian immigrants, and in particular, the growth of, 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 of Asians in this country and their immigration to the United States, and they're part of our industrial history, the building of the great, rail, the great right, railroad that linked both East and West, the Continental Railroad, right? So he advocated for the rights of the Chinese in particular and other Asians to come to the United States, to immigrate here, and to build a life here, and to join common cause. And I wonder, too, we're talking about immigrants coming from other countries, to what extent he anticipated the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. I know we've talked about people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote about this, uh, but that, too, talking about the composite nation, yes. had a tremendous impact. It did, it did. And uh, right, you're talking about the Great Migration. Yeah. It happened in a couple of different ways, right? And so right after the Civil War, loads of, of African Americans left the South, right, in great migrations towards the North and towards the free states just to get away, right, because they didn't know about the, con they, they were being oppressed in the conditions of the South. Those who could get away did. Mm -hmm. Right, and there were different waves of this. There were different waves. There was the initial wave after the Civil War, and then another wave during the height of, of Jim Crow violence, the lynching yeah. epidemic in the United States. And so this is one of the places where it's useful to think about Douglas um, and to look at his historical record. Douglas actually was opposed to people moving as part of the first great migration. He thought that they should stay right um, in place where they helped to build the land and they build institutions and to build the agricultural industry and claim it as their own, mm -hmm. right? So he had this, if you will, larger political vision in mind of black Americans staying in place, fighting for what was theirs. But that, of course, right, wasn't in keeping with some of the, in, with the individual interests of, at the time of black Americans. 
and communities. We felt, well, you know, it's one thing to stay and fight for one's right to the land, but un in, in conditions that are, over, that are overwhelmingly violent and repressive, many people want to stay for their lives, an opportunity for their children to get away from the brutality of Jim Crow America and to go north for greater, uh, for greater and diverse economic, educational, and life opportunities. He reversed himself yeah. at some point, but initially he was not in favor of that. And it's one thing that, you know, it's a, one of the difficult parts of his legacy. He learned, right? I mean, he's not a saint. He, he, he learned from his mistakes and learned, from, learned by listening to people and learned by right, hearing, uh, hearing feedback and getting criticism for those who oppose Right, his political, his political and economic uh, policies when they weren't in keeping with their particular interests. Well, and there was, as you know, uh, immediately after the Civil War, yeah. there was genuine hope that political and economic change would happen in the South and that uh, there were black congressmen and senators mm -hmm. who were elected and mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like change would occur for the better, but mm. then with the collapse of Reconstruction yes. by, you know, the late uh, 1870s, presumably yeah. that had a lot to do with his changing views, that his views change in relationship to how reality was changing. Yes, yes, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, one of his most beautiful pieces uh, he wrote and, and gave us and, 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 and uh, presented was called Lessons of the Hour where he, uh, he presented to right, uh, an organi uh, a group of black leaders and intellectuals at the time. And, uh, you know, um, at the end of his life, a lion of the, Ameri of the, of the abolition movement, right, um, uh, reflected on the, one of the darkest periods of American history. Um, and, some, and also events that could have, right, uh, questioned his legacy. Right, because he fought for freedom, he fought for the United States, he fought for right, Black Americans to join the Civil War cause, yeah. to dress in, in blue and pick up and pick up rifles and fight for right, fight including for two of his sons. Strikes. Yes, yes, including yeah. two of his sons, and so he um, he fought for all this, and it was a great disappointment and a great letdown for him to see the reversals mm -hmm. of his civil of the civil rights event that he fought so hard for, right, and that he saw people around him struggling to maintain and not receiving the full benefits of. But as I tried to emphasize yesterday, he did not give up hope on the, law, uh, on the project, right? If the, uh, right, right? if the arc of history bends toward justice, that arc is a long arc. And so he counseled patience and sure. fidelity, right? Hope in that long cause. But hope uh, coupled with activism. Absolutely, then. absolutely. <laughs> Douglas was never a pacifist. Yeah. Uh, he, did, he did not sit on his laurels. He did not sit on his hands. We get this from his, his earliest narratives. For example, in his really his very famous narrative, the, the, the first one, the 1845 narrative, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, he, there's this really remarkable moment. He, um, of course, uh, he's born in, um, on the eastern shore of Maryland, right, on a plantation, doesn't know who his father is, doesn't know his birth date, really and uh, barely spends any time with his mother because of, the, because of the demand to be separated from his parents by the slave master. Um, and at, at some point, as you know, he's fortunate enough to be shipped off to Baltimore to serve um, in the household of, um, his, of, the, of the family, the extended family of his master. And there he, lear he learns how to read and to write by subterfuge, first by intentional lessons from the mistress of the house, and then by subterfuge. Wonderful story, that, of how he learned to, to read and write. Anyways, after waking up, up his mind through the power of literacy, um, conversation and dialogue with the people around him, he shipped back down to the plantation in Tuckahoe, Maryland. And there, he is sent out to a slave breaker, someone who was meant to discipline him because he got, you know, uppity. He got too big for his britches, right? Um, and he learned how to read and to write and thought of himself as, um, as thought of himself as someone who could minister to himself, right, um, and minister to other slaves. And so they wanted to break him. So they send him to a guy by the name of Covey, whose job it was to break slaves, right, the way that you break a horse or that you break a farm animal. 
you make them docile and passive. And, you're, and, and Douglas received a lot of abuse. In a really magical moment, during a bit of free time, and he didn't have much of it, he went out to um, a place um, near his, the plantation where he was employed and looked out over the Chesapeake Bay. And there he sent out what he called an address to the Chesapeake Bay and spoke movingly and poetically about the moving ships on the water and about where they were going, you know, and their voyages. And he cried there. Yeah, I think he literally cried. He, it's a very moving passage because he says, why has God abandoned me, right? Why, has, why do I not have a father? Why is there no justice? It was an existential crisis. Sure. And then he resolved at that point, and it's a low point, and just like every classic conversion story, he's broken, right, he's lost, and that then he's found, and he resolves with, right, with all his might and all his power, right, to free himself, right? He takes faith in his faith, mm -hmm. um, he takes faith in his own powers, and he resolves that, look, I'm not going to let the embers of freedom, which literacy lit up for him, to die. And from that point on, right, he starts a journey, like a, like a classic hero story, right? You go down to the pit of hell, and you yeah. face your monsters. And then you hit, you battle your monsters, and then, like, uh, you know, like Orpheus, or, uh, you know, Ulysses, right? He's got to make his way back from the pit of hell, back from the pit of Hades. And he, right, so he has a slow ascent right, um, to, to freedom, right? His monster, of course, isn't, right, the Scylla or the Shabardes. It's, uh, it's Covey, the yeah. slave breaker, who he battles and he bests in battle. And, he, and uh, what he, he says that his feeling of freedom, of liberty, of manhood blossoms at that point. And he'll never be, right, a slave in form, even in form, like, like the way that you and I as philosophers talk about form. He's not fundamentally enslaved, even though he is in fact slave. I am no longer a slave in form, even though I am a slave in fact, is what he says. That's right. And of course, his battle with Covey, the fact that he's victorious. One thing I always wondered is, well, why didn't Covey report him? Yes. But then as we discuss, yes. Covey would have lost his reputation would have as a slave ba breaker. Right. He was broken by a slave. Yeah, right. so that was a, a, Great a literal reversal. reversal. Right. In that story, Covey has Douglas as a young, te as a teenager, right? Six, all of 16 to 17, right? Um, doing really serious farm labor. And Douglas is not used to this kind of farm labor. And he was told to steer an ox. I've never steered an ox. I have no idea how you do it where you fix a cart to an ox, and then you have, and you steer the ox by a couple of ropes, one tied to each horn. And so, Covey knew exactly what was gonna happen. The, uh, the ox, right, um, uh, took off with <laughs> Douglas in tow and crashed the cart and into the woods. Douglas couldn't control it. And Covey whipped Douglas because of it. And Douglas said, at that point, I, like this ox, am meant to be broken. We are meant to be brutalized. And at the end, he recovers his manhood, his humanity, and right, he is no longer a brute. And unlike a brute, he doesn't kill Covey. He's, he's entirely in control of his fight. For those right, who are watching or listening to this, right, if you've had any practice yeah. with judo or, 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 or any kind of martial arts, when you read that passage, it's careful. Douglas is in complete control at every single moment. Right? He knows every blow. He's in control of every kick. Um, he could have choked the man to death, but he doesn't. He's in control. And it's Covey, the slave breaker, who is reduced to the brute that he is. Douglas calls Covey a snake. Beautiful biblical reference, right? Douglas is the, the man who was made to be an ox, and, and, and Covey was the man who made himself, right? And, it's who, and it's who made himself, and it's who the system made into a snake. And so this, 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 this man who is no longer a brute, right, who's, who's recovered himself from brutality, beats the man who has descended into brutality. And there you have Douglas's right, redemption story. Well, one thing you also stressed uh, in your presentation was Douglas's use of biblical yes. quotations, particularly right. from the, the book of Isaiah. And, and Jeremiah, how, too. And yeah. Jeremiah. Right, yeah. 
there's a lot of there's a lot of these quotes. I mean, in the symbology that I just discussed, right? There's Douglas. I I, I drew a, I drew a parallel with the the Odyssey, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Orpheus here, right? You have a hero's quest, right? I, um, if for any fans out there of Joseph Campbell, that's where I got that idea. Right? He's doing the classic hero's quest, right? He goes out in a great Jeremiah, and he has to uh, defeat the monsters and and recover the golden fleece, right? You know, like Jason and the Argonauts. He's got to do something like that, and then he goes to freedom. So there's a beautiful mytho, mytho, mythological poetic story in the narrative that's powerful. That still calls to us, like all mythologies call to us, right? Uh, but then, but this is actually this happened to the man. Um, so I drew that parallel. But he, but Douglas drew, draws other biblical parallels. There's Covey as a snake. There's him as the him as right to be brutalized like the ox. Um, there is the wrestling on the ground, right? It is right. It is you know Jacob wrestling with the angels. Yes, yes. Right. It's all of that. And he would have known all he of would this have as known he was writing that. the narrative. And it would have really sparked to his readers of the time in the 1840, in the late, the mid 19th century in America. Those stories would have popped out. Those parallels would have popped out. They would have seen in him, right? They would have seen in Douglas parallels with the Old Testament stories that weave together a story of personhood, of morality, and of nation building. And you also see Douglas as almost the epitome of a self-made person. Yes. Became a businessman, yes. an orator, a, really yes. a celebrity. As we're yes. talking about, he was the most photographed American of the 19th century, and that yes. was deliberate to yeah, be yeah, sure. Yeah. His well, photo was known. I deign to call him an influencer. Yes. <laughs> he, because, you know, it, it's ridiculous. He wasn't doing the TikTok thing or the Instagram thing, but he was well photographed, and he knew the importance of, right, uh, the photographic medium, of the visual for his political work. He never smiled. Yeah. Because he didn't want to, uh, you know, participate in the trope, as the kids call it, the trope, the meme of the happy slave. Mm -hmm. That he was very serious. Right, very not dour, but serious and stern in his photographs. Right, I'm here about business. I'm here about business dealing with a serious issue. That's what I'm I'm doing here. Um, so yeah, he was very much into that. Self-made man was one of his go-to speeches after the end of slavery. Like every other politician and political figure out there, he's got to make some. He's got he supports his family by giving speeches. And so one of his can, one of his speeches. Dare I say a can speech was called self-made man or self-made men. Mm -hmm. And that's really particular about the narrative because it's a story of a person who, right, who aims to free himself. So to, 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 to fill in the philosophy, Tim, it's a story of autonomy. Yes. Right? And we as philosophers teach story, we teach philosophies about autonomy, right? Autonomo, self-law giving. Right is the translation from the ancient Greek, and so you see versions of this in in um, Aristotle, right in the Nicomachean Ethics of being in charge of one's choices and one's decisions. You see modern examples in Kant in the idea of moral autonomy, where I internalize the moral law, and then in of course uh, Mill and its personal autonomy, where Mill says we should be sovereign over our minds and bodies, and then of course you have this weird thing with the Nietzsche, which is a kind of if you will. Creative personal autonomy, you know, set this this self-made man. Now Douglas is no Nietzschean. Douglas is no. more Kantian and more Millian. But I meant, but I want to stress this because one of the criticisms of Douglas is that it all becomes self-made. But really, when you read his narratives closely, when you read not only narratives but his second autobiography, he wrote three for the viewing audience, right? Mm -hmm. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. The second is my bondage and my freedom. And the third one, the long one, the capstone of his life is the life and times of Frederick Douglass. But it's the second one that's the masterpiece. And there he talks about these groups he participated in, the learning to read and write and, and trading lessons, trading reading and writing lessons for bread on the docks in, in Baltimore, yeah. right? Um, discuss, discussing matters of abolition with the Irish and the black dock workers. Right, the other people in the trade he was becoming, uh, you know, trading bread for lessons with 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 street urchins. This is this was Douglas's life, and so 
It's filled with other people. Well, that, I think that's a very important people. point, which yeah. you stress. There's, we tend to think self-made. Yeah. If I did it all by myself, yeah. I didn't right. have any help. When in fact he had great help from he allies, from his, his wife initially who helped yeah. him to escape. Yes. Uh, then the various abolitionists and exactly. people he met when he was overseas. And one reason he moved here to Rochester is because he'd made connections yes. with uh, the Post family and others yes. and was welcomed here. Right, right. It, it, this is an amazing place with overlays of history, it's, uh, uh, overlays of American history. So he wanted to get away from the influence of uh, William Garrison, right? So he needed to get out of the sphere of Boston, yeah. right? And Garrison, and no shade to Garrison, but Garrison, like any media mogul, <laughs> any leader of a political movement, is a bit controlling. And Douglas felt that was a little too close to the experience of, right, master-slave uh, of relationship yeah. that he experiences. And he was not going to be bossed around by any man anymore, right? And of course, it has racial connotations and power connotations. He didn't want to be bossed around by this guy anymore, right? Um, but, and he became, he became more of an independent thinker, right? Had contrary thoughts than Garrison did about the Constitution and about the future and about whether or not America had to go into a civil war. Yes. And Garrison was a pacifist and a separatist, right? A secessionist. And Gar wanted a clean hand. And Doug was like, no, we can't have clean hands because a whole bunch of black people are enslaved. And the time to end it is now. And the time to end it is now. <laughs> so let's write, let us, let us stir the conscience of the nation. Let us bring, as I, was, I said it during the talk, the whirlwind, the thunder, right? The lightning in the rain, the fire. Let us, right, let us free, right, the people. That's right. But on autonomy, because, you know, you might have other philosophy students or philosophers watch this video. There's a new, there's a newish category of autonomy we like to talk about, uh, a relational autonomy. And it's a really nice way to think about yeah, it, yeah. right? This idea that yes, we are self-law giving. Yes, we should be, we should be, but probably aren't complete. We probably aren't, and according to some philosophers, we aren't at all sovereign over our minds and bodies. But we'll, but we are not like little Robinson Crusoe stuck on an island by ourselves. We are in relation with other people. So when you or I make decisions, right, and we build our lives, we're like this, we're in conversation. So our autonomy is always, right, um, is always supported, undergirded, and propped up by our relations with each other, right? No man is an island unto exactly. himself. Well, our time is drawing to a close, but I think, uh, as you've proven, we're still in conversation Absolutely. with Frederick Douglass. We are. We have his words, we have his life story, uh, his influence. I'm delighted that this is your first visit to Rochester, absolutely. where we're very proud of our connections with Douglas, but it will not be your last visit. Well, thank you. Thank and you. we will definitely have you back and continue this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity and hospitality, and thank you to the community of St. John Fisher University. And thank you, Dr. Sundstrom. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and for watching the show, and we'll see you next time.